in. Okay. No so one's leaving. Our, uh, well, that's all that attempt to get people out before the report. 20 below. So our, uh, my monthly superintendent report to the school committee, I always start with recognition. So this evening I'd like to express my appreciation to Nancy Cricker Yaman. Uh, Nancy's been instrumental in expanding the work of the Embrace Diversity Club at Hopkins Academy. She's one of our parents, and she recently also did a presentation for Hadley Elementary School students on Dr. Martin Luther King, and I heard at the PTO that the students really enjoyed it and the faculty appreciated it. So I'm very grateful for all of her contributions. And additionally, I would like to thank the PTO. The PTO on Friday, February 13th, did the Warm Your Hearts Luncheon for our faculty. I miss Douglas is patting her stomach, but the audience can't see that. But I would like to play <laughs> off of that and say when I walked out of having my soup at HES, I described it as a borderline spiritual experience. That food was so good. They did a wonderful job, and they are just so generous. So thank you to the to all of the parents who helped with that teacher appreciation and staff appreciation luncheon. I provided in the, pack up for the packet for the school committee a draft entry report, and a lot of the documents in there are really redundant. So we've been collecting information since I started here. The appendices include, for example, um, all of the MCAS analysis that helped to inform goals, the analysis of the student survey data from Hopkins Academy, the analysis of the educator survey data through TELS, um, and finally, analysis of family and community survey data. And from looking at all of the data, having conversations with, uh, with the school committee, having individual and group conversations with faculty, with parents, and I delineate in the report some of the steps that I've taken to just start to collect information about the community and some of the emerging themes that have come up. And it's very clear to me that in Hadley that there's a belief among community members, among the faculty, and certainly from what I hear from the school committee, that all children deserve access to a challenging, rigorous, and relevant curriculum, that it's important, this came through loudly and clearly in student data and conversations with teachers and with parents, that learning should integrate hands-on experiences, inspire students' imaginations, and provide students opportunities to create and to collaborate using 21st century tools. And there's also a lot of conversations that I've been having with folks, um, faculty more recently, and I do hear this from parents as well, about the importance of providing students with opportunities not solely to acquire in terms of um, great transcripts and to achieve in terms of grades, but also to provide students with meaningful opportunities to contribute to their community. Our students certainly have a great deal to contribute. They care deeply about matters that pertain to their school immediately and outside of their school. And it, it, it's clear that we need to keep that at the forefront of our minds, that the curriculum should just not be narrowly defined as an academic exercise. But opportunities to build character are important and to, to demonstrate and exhibit the character that they possess. That certainly we've heard loudly and clearly that we need to pay as much attention to the social, emotional, and physical well-being of students as we do to their academic achievement. That parents must be treated as partners with the school district and that we must consistently seek and implement their input. And that education and learning should not be limited to core academic subjects. It's clear I also put a a survey online. I haven't had a lot of responses to that survey on the district's website, but one theme even in small responses that echoes themes that I've heard in individual and group conversations is this idea that in this community art and music aren't specials, they're essentials. And that's really lovely. It's a, it's a wonderful attitude to have that these aren't extras but that they're ab absolutely essential and certainly physical well-being is included in that um, as well. And so one of the things I asked in the superintendent's report is just from the school committee, the next steps here would be that I would vet this with the leadership team has had input, that we would look at it collectively, that I would also put it in places where faculty could take a look at it, give me feedback, and post it on the website to provide parents an opportunity to give feedback on whether or not they feel as <coughs> that kind of accurately captures some of the important priorities of the district. This isn't something that we're then done with. Um, it's 
kind of an exercise that I would recommend that we engage in annually before reevaluating district strategy and priority and setting district priorities and strategy. So the questions that I was, I was presenting to the school committee is if you felt as though the report as it is um, includes sufficient what we call count, see, and hear data, opportunities to converse with people, does it reflect things that I've directly observed and um, does it integrate enough quantitative data, does it respond to needs and interests of stakeholders, and does it balance clarity of next step, steps and strategy development with the flexibility to ensure responsiveness? So is there enough room to move? And those are just some of the questions that I posed to the school committee. So short of that, is there anything that you want to say to me, you must do this or else you're never going to understand this place? No. <laughs> pick corn at 4 a.m. What's that pick if she gets up and picks corn with the kids at 4 a.m.? Um, you know, I would say... I think you would do it. I would. Yeah, that's just it. That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Christopher, I was like, yeah, well, you may not want to challenge her unless you really want her at her house at 4 o'clock in the morning. So, yeah. So we actually talked about that. One of the faculty, two faculty members and I talked about a service, kind of a service learning, something that the students here used to do at one point. They called it um, picking diamonds, gleaning. Oh, goodness. They followed the potato pickers. Now I'm really the, not they doing well. The field one year. Yes, and then packaging these things and, and delivering the potatoes. I'm so sorry to the farmers that D Rex is watching this saying she really just said picking diamonds <laughs> referring to potatoes. I did my best, D. Sorry. Um, so we did actually think about how we could integrate the work that children do into service learning. So any feedback? That was good. I liked it. I think the goals are good. I, yeah. You know, I always am looking for how we're going to quantify, mm -hmm. and so it was good to see some of that. Some of that. I think that's always a challenge because our goals are so aspirational mm -hmm. that coming up with a quantitative measurement can be very difficult. So, mm -hmm. um, but I thought that what you did was good in reaching that, I think that that's something we will always need to think about and work on. Okay. And we've already told you that we've got your goals around the MPAS. That's mm -hmm. the yearly project. Yes. <laughs> but she made it over two years since I did. One I did, based on your feedback. I, do, I, I was just happy to see this from all of the stakeholders. Can you remind me on on the evaluation tool you gave us? You have there's one, two, and three. One instructional leadership, professional culture, and then family and community engagement. Are those the general categories provided by DESE? And then we have our own specific goal related to it underneath. Right. Is that how? <clears throat> so what I did with this, which is the next part of this report. So what Sorry. I did with this. That's okay. That's a perfect segue. <laughs> So what I provided for you this evening, and I thought it would be helpful to go through some of the recommendations from one of the documents from the Mass Association of School Committees charting the course that did an excellent job of a workbook called Superintendent Evaluation, which you can find on MASC's website. In summary, they had a document. We took their format, right. right? So I did not present to you the forms from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I think that MASC's forms are far more user-friendly. Yes. MASC had suggested example goals. They were from 2010, and they predated the, the new standards that were adopted right, by the right, state. Right. So what's required, and there's a formative evaluation that's required, and, and there are a lot of options for how you proceed with this, but there's a formative evaluation that's required. My goals are over a two-year period, so you could technically do a formative, formal formative evaluation this June and give ratings, and simply at our next do meeting do a public kind of progress check-in. This is where I'm concerned. This is what appears to be going well. I would like you to do more of this. Um, and so as you see, that number one is actually language from the standard. So the requirement, that first one that says instructional leadership, that's the actual language from the standards against which I need to be evaluated. You're required to provide me with a formative and eventually a summative rating. If I do not receive, if I am not proficient in standard one, 
I cannot be given an overall rating of proficient. So I could be proficient on the other three, but if I'm not proficient in standard one instructional leadership, then I cannot have um, a rating of proficient. I am not, um, I'm not being presumptuous here, so please don't hear it as this. I, I would just say I would strongly discourage um, the school committee from, from any ratings of exemplary. Um, you can say kind things if you would like, but I would strongly discourage that. I mean, the reality is that, um, um, that I just would strongly discourage that. Um, and, uh, and then, the, um, because we always have ways to improve and, and people, I think, should, well, that's enough of that, so I just would discourage it. <laughs> so underneath that, you see a student learning goal. Um, and I'm sorry, I will say it's not because I don't want to do exemplary work. I'm a first year superintendent. <laughs> and I, so that's it. I'm a first year superintendent and I think it's important to set reasonable expectations yes. and communicate that to the community and to um, the faculty at large. Uh, student learning goal, then I put the student learning goal underneath. These are the goals that you approved because it ties directly to instructional leadership. And these are the goals you previously approved. Yeah. So each standard gets a rating, each goal gets a rating, of, and then overall there's a summative rating. And it's simply the summative rating that is recorded. And the summative rating is a somewhat subjective analysis of between progress on goals and performance against standards, where do we feel like how do we feel like my how do you feel I'm doing how well am I how good is my work so um, all of these uh, the discussion has to happen in open session it's a public discussion um, and as I said what what MASC recommends is that the school committee first agree that the instrument makes sense. One thing I'm noticing now is that I'll have to add a page for you to come to an overall right. rating. Um, and in addition to that, it's one, there can be discussion, but it's one rating. Right. So the school committee must arrive at one rating. It's not three individual ratings. Now when it comes time to do a Summative ratings, sometimes school committees. We would hope that would be five soon. <laughs> yes, yes, five. Sorry. Normally five people here. Um, so when it comes time to do a summative rating, sometimes school committees elect to each individual person fill something out. Those individual forms are not subject to open meeting law public records unless referred to at a public meeting, at which point then they must be. So each individual can fill one out, give those to the chair who then fills out one document. Other school committees elect to simply have a public discussion and come to consensus in public. So it's it will be the school committee's choice. There's no legislation that dictates how you do that. The legislation is only clear that it must be an open session, that if documents are referred to at any point, those documents must become a matter of public record. The only thing that can be an executive session would be um, disciplinary action or something tied to contract. Is the scale used for the summative rating the same as the formative? Yes. Okay. yes. And we are making a decision on the process by when? So if you would like me to, if you'd like to think about it more, if you'd like to continue the discussion, or you can have a discussion about um, even just the instrument. If the instrument, you don't have to decide on the process this evening. If the instrument works for you, I will add a page that is an overall rating page. But if there's anything that you would like changed, if this works for you. I like the instrument. I, I think like it's it. clear. I, and yeah. I, I'm glad that the, um, the mask uh, group, you know, supports this or uses this as a model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But before we agree to it, let's let's wait until next month when Humira is here so that she has some input. Although sure. I hear she's watching on television. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So that would be, and will you add the summative so we can see what that yes. will look like and yes, then I will. bring it back next month? Yes. So if you bring it back next month, is that to also deliberate the rating or to just no. talk about the I think instrument. it's the instrument and the process okay. would be mm -hmm. next month's agenda. And then when would the actual 
discussion of the rating be like what's the target time? So you can do a formative rating in April. You can do a public progress check-in and just say this is working without recording a formative rating, but read into the minutes. This is what's going well. This is where we'd like to see you improve. This is where we'd like you to change a focus. Um, and and do so you have the option of doing an official formative this June and then a summative the following June because you've stretched the goals over two years you could do that but in terms of just progress monitoring probably after you look at the instrument again with Humera here next month then I would recommend that there's at least a public discussion about any um, concerns or anything that you would like continued or expanded upon. So April, you said. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Next on the report, um, athletics program evaluation of policies, practices, and procedures. So back in the fall, we had a conversation. At that time, we had a school committee member also on school committee, a gentleman named Sean Mackin. At that time, he had volunteered to work with me, work with Mr. Beck and Mr. Sudnick to take a look at our athletics program. He did resign from the school committee, but he was kind enough when I reached out to him to meet with me this Friday. And back in the fall, we talked about overall, it, it would make sense to evaluate the policies that the school committee has that pertain directly to athletics, mm -hmm. to look over some of the documents that we have in our athletics program, whether it's handbooks or mission statements, all of those documents and ensure a high degree of alignment between the intent of the school committee, the policies that are on record, mm -hmm. and the practices that we have in place. After meeting with Mr. Mackin on Friday, he was extraordinarily helpful. If he's watching, I really want to underscore that fact. He brought a document from the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Association. I have not find, found something comparable through MIAA. I will contact MIAA <coughs> and ask them. This document through CIAA is essentially a template that delineates how an athletics program could undergo a self-study that would look something like NEASC. So they have various standards, and they're looking at many of the same questions that we're interested in. So they direct you as to what documents you would want to review, the kinds of questions that you would ask. After you do self-study, then in Connecticut, you contact CIAA, and they would then send out two ADs from different communities and two administrators. So this little team, it's like mini NEASC. Mr. Beck does a lot with NEASC. It's like a mini NEASC model. Even if MIAA does not have this, and to my knowledge, they don't. I, I've never heard of this degree of self-study in the Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association. I still would reach out to MIAA for recommendations for people to come, and I'm certain that there are, I already, I know of individuals from outside of the community who have experience as high school principals, as athletic directors, as coaches who are highly active in MIAA, who would be happy to assist us with this. The self-study and the, the documentation through self-study <laughs> and the documentation through the visit would all be documentation that we would want to make public. Um, and so that's the process that uh, Sean and I talked about. I thought it was an excellent recommendation. He also provided me with examples of various mission statements from different athletic programs, and he provided me with some booster guidelines that um, he had worked with the school district to develop that were, I thought they were interesting and certainly worth having a conversation about. Worked with this school district to develop? No, oh, no, okay. in Foxborough where he's oh, okay. been doing an internship. Okay. So part so of So the self-study is done by the administration? So in this case, as we talked, just like any self-study, Mr. Beck, Mr. Sudnick, mm -hmm. myself. So right. that's, and then you invite outsiders in to look at mm -hmm. not only your responses to the questions, but the documents that you evaluated to come mm -hmm. to conclusions about that. And then with you, Part of what the outsiders would do, again, if it's off the NEASC model, is they're looking at the conclusions that you've drawn from your analysis and suggesting then how to interpret those findings and translate perhaps some of them into recommendations. And I'm looking at you, Brian, because I know you do a lot of this with NEASC. Yeah, it, it typically, I mean, that's a, uh, for secondary schools, it's a 10-year process, and 
you come out of a decennial report with various stages of subsequent reporting, but in general it's the idea of giving commendations and then over the course of the two year and five year period you need to respond to the recommendations that are given. So if there's something that comes out in terms of um, issues of integrity in the hiring process, then you know, we would want to respond to that recommendation with putting something in place and yeah. following a process or a procedure. And the timelines that Mr. Beck is referring to, obviously, are NIAS timelines. These would be very yeah. Yeah. short timelines. Sure. So it's findings, recommendations, right. and then a timeline to go with it. It was an excellent document, and I didn't have, I don't have a copy of Friday. I looked at it. Anybody can find it if you go to CIA, the Connecticut Interscholastic. Athletic Association. If you go to their website, if you if you search on their website for the self study document, you can also send a um, link out. And as I said, I will contact MIAA directly to ask if they have a document, but they don't have one on their website. And I've never known of any school districts who did self study through MIAA and athletics. So the school committee role in this is to wait for a report, and then if there were adjustments that needed to be made in our policies, mm -hmm. we would do it at that point. Mm -hmm. I like this better than the idea that, you know, what was talked about right. months ago was creating an athletic subcommittee of the school committee, which yeah, I which I felt was outside the realm of yeah. the school committee's roles and responsibilities. I think this is a better idea. Yeah. It gets to the same issue we wanted to get to, which was an examination of policy, practice, and procedure. Right, and how it's matching. And, and then results in a report to right. the school committee rather than the school committee direct involvement. So if we find that we don't have policies around certain things, like appointment positions, mm -hmm. and we need to have those developed, is that the role of the school committee policy subcommittee to work and get those developed? You know, <laughs> hiring... Whoever that may be. <laughs> it may not be the same. I'm just asking what our purview is. I, I'm not... I'm not sure that you don't have to check with Fred because I'm not con convinced that the school committee does create hiring policy because we are not involved in hiring for yeah, positions I'd, other I'd, than the superintendent and the uh, director of I think services. I agree. I think it would be really important to have Fred advise us on then once we have the recommendations, what's in the purview of the school committee and what's in the purview of administration. Yeah. But I, Because I just... I don't know. I don't know either. And That's you and asking. and you and I talked, I believe, in the grocery store, mm -hmm. about whether we also want some policies for all of our many groups that right. give the schools money. Again, I don't know if that's school committee policy or some other practice and procedure. Well, I guess if, if I mean Annie has mentioned boosters, I know we have a very short policy on boosters in the district manual, basically right. saying. We have, one. we have them. <laughs> right. I mean, exactly. so if there should be policies around whatever boosters they are, whether it be athletics, music, any of those, and the accepting of funds and any rules around that, that's, right. I mean, it'd be good to know what other mm -hmm. districts do, what the state would recommend. Mm -hmm. I suspect that is school committee purview. Mm -hmm. Except, you know, that feels more rules for yes. accepting money from right. outside. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that probably is. But the sort of personnel kind of issues. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm kind of, can I ask a question? I'm kind of wondering about the. I'm not actually here about any of this sports business, um, but I was kind of, I'm kind of wondering about um, about you know that that statement about the school committee's role in terms of the policies for hiring and things because. It's my understanding that coaches um, and their, their salary scale and everything is paid through the Hadley Public Schools. And if, if a teacher was to be hired as a coach, let's just say, right, we're already underneath the union guidelines, so there are hiring policies and procedures for the Hadley Public Schools, which the school committee sets forth, right? We don't hire teachers. No, I know you don't do the hiring of the teachers, but in terms of the policies and procedures, the only for thing the only thing that we can say is we can set standards. If we wanted to, we could say every teacher in the Hadley School Committee has to have a PhD. But other than that, which we're not going to do. <laughs> um, but rumors. that's the oh, that's the only way that school committees are involved in hiring beyond the superintendent and the director of student services. 
I guess I really don't understand because if you're hired, you are then an employee of the Hadley Public School System, and the school system, and the the school committee oversees everything that happens to the Hadley Public School System. So I guess I'm a little confused. If you don't do it, who would? Right. I, I guess I'm confused. Like well, I legitimately don't it's, understand. It's, it's education reform law. They wanted to take school committees out of those kinds of decisions. The primary hiring authority in any building is the building principal. Right. So that came out of Massachusetts education reform. What happens when the building principal recommends for hire, unless there's some other procedure in place that's been duly noted, perhaps by a, a departure in mass ed reform that would somehow be noted by the school committee, I, I don't know why anybody would do that. But this typically, the principal is the person who's the primary hiring authority. The principal may bring together a committee of people in terms of making a decision about hiring. Ultimately, the principal then makes a recommendation for hire. The hiring recommendation comes to the superintendent. And the law will state that the superintendent then has ultimate authority to approve or deny. I would not interfere in a hiring decision unless I felt as though the basis for not hiring somebody had represented some sort of equal opportunity employment or was a violation in the terms of Unit A, a violation of the Unit A contract. There is a handbook for non-union personnel in Hadley Public Schools. It clearly delineates that non-union personnel are employees at will, um, so they are not protected under the Unit A collective bargaining agreement. That's separate. Um, or it's also for people who are not protected under the Unit C bargaining agreement. So it's the principal's hiring authority. I then sign a, a hiring recommendation. My decision is whether or not there's any basis, is there a reasonable basis for me to withhold a recommendation that a principal has made. Okay. The business manager also signs off on hiring recommendations. What he's saying is he's attesting to the fact that these were actually positions that were budgeted. So just for example, we brought the new position before the school committee because that is not in the FY15 operating budget. It will require the use of special ed stabilization, school choice monies. And we cannot use that money because there is a policy without the express approval, voted approval of the school committee. Great, thank you for that clarity. I just was a little uncertain. So I have a question about, you mentioned boosters, and that there's really no guidelines for how boosters clubs are set up because they're sort of a free entity that just donates money to the school. Is that my I'm group. sorry, can I ask your name? Because oh, uh, I can get Barbie it. Barbie Anderson, I'm a parent. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so I just, I guess I'm not familiar with the whole, how the whole boosters thing, either band boosters or sports boosters and how that works in terms of open. Any kind of, you know, whether it be mission statements, chapter, you know, organization of those booster clubs, none of that is within our district policy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And our district policy has a very specific policy just recognizing that there are booster organizations um, within the district. But beyond that, I see nothing about any kind of um, regulations. Now, we have had some groups in the past come to school committee meetings to present donations, but as I understand it, that's not required. In, in some cases, it's more to just make the public aware that this was a donation from whatever cause it may be associated with. Okay. So the Boosters Club can basically run themselves however they want and be open or not open or whatever, however they choose to run themselves? They are private organizations. But I think part of what we are talking about is talking to the school's attorney to see if there is anything, if there is any greater policy that we can establish. We don't know the answer. And some of the conversation that I had on Friday, what was very helpful is just by virtue of the fact that Mr. Mackin had developed guidelines as part of an internship project in a different school, demonstrates the fact that guidelines for booster clubs are not necessarily ubiquitous across the Commonwealth. That it's quite common for booster clubs to operate fairly autonomously within school mm -hmm. districts, so that this was a great project to come up with developing a set of guidelines. I'm not implying in any way that we would just adopt the guidelines set forth for the Foxborough School District, but part of the analysis of doing that self-study is asking questions about where have people raised concerns, where have people expressed questions, or where are things ambiguous or, or lack some degree of transparency that make people uncomfortable. Identify those areas, see if there's any documentation that currently exists that may help 
people to understand current practices and where documentation doesn't exist, identify districts that have <coughs> templates and models that we may want to adopt. Well, I think my concern would be that, and I'm part of the newly resuming band boosters, and mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of guidelines, and you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're just opening up to everybody that wants to come, but because we're raising money under the auspices of doing something for the school children of Hadley, I feel like we have a, a responsibility mm -hmm. to be transparent in what we're doing mm -hmm. in terms of financial, who's a member, and I would, right. I would anticipate that that would be somewhat of an expectation of any boosters club because they are raising money under the name of Hadley Public Schools. Mm -hmm. right? So I would have that concern. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tina, did you have a question? I just, um, is it this, your, the school committee's intention or the superintendent's intention to kind of look at the, the policy or the procedure that the superintendent talked about, the hiring process? I understand the state process and I understand the principal's role and the superintendent's role, but is it the school's intention to kind of put checks and balance into that process? So there may be a little bit more objectivity in that process as opposed to just how you outlined it. So first, that's an excellent question, Tina. And when I'm responding, I don't want the public to hear me as responding as though there's some foregone conclusion. What I know is that we need to take a look at all of the issues that have been brought up. And I would, again, strongly encourage you, if you have trouble finding it, I have no problem emailing you the link, because one of the sections speaks very specifically about, or includes in the section, the hiring of coaches, hiring and super. So there are very specific questions about that in this particular document. And again, I'm not saying that we would just wholeheartedly take this document, but it, I thought it was exceptional in terms of getting at some of the questions that people have had. Thank you. If I could add a comment too, there are procedures in place for anyone if they feel like there's some violation of a civil right that's occurred that they can file a letter of complaint and there's a procedure for following that process as well. So there's always another recourse. Thank you. Can I ask another question? Um, about I know that you spoke a little bit about, you know, that there's no real like set timeline for looking at how this would play out. But it seems to me that um, that there's a lot of topic and conversation around athletics in Hadley, good, bad, or otherwise. And it seems to me that it's sort of not a pressing issue, but I think it's an issue that deserves a lot of attention and and. Um, and looking into, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, one thing that I was wondering um, in terms of policies, procedures, practice, you know, obviously, you know, you know, I think that maybe there is a little room for improvement, but I also feel that um, I realize time, you know, it can take time to, to look at these things, but we don't have two years, five years, 10 years. I mean, by that time, I could be dead and gone. You know what I mean? I mean, no, so I think, I think that, you know, I think that, you know, taking a realistic approach into mm -hmm. which policies maybe need looking into mm -hmm. currently, or um, yeah, I was wondering if Mr. Mackin had any data on, you know, that in terms of what, you know, did he find out anything else interesting that should be looked into, like currently for the school committee? I don't know. Well, I, I think the idea is if we're if we're going to do this, we're going to do it now, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and on the other hand, I, if we're going to do it, we should do it well. So mm -hmm. I don't want it to be rushed through, but as mm -hmm. you point out, cur you know, clearly we all know, everyone in this room knows that there have been issues with athletics at Hopkins Academy for as long as I've been on the school committee and I am in my 10th year, and I'm sure before then. So let's do the self-study, let's look at it carefully, let's do it quickly but thoroughly, and let's not rush through it, but get it done expeditiously. Excellent. What I can do and what I will do, I certainly share, I'm not being facetious when I say I too share your sense of urgency. This has been the most surprising part of this position is the, uh, the um, amount that I've learned about athletics over the past few months. So I will make sure that we bring a suggested anticipated timeline to the next meeting too. So that can be shared publicly and the school committee can have that information. Good. Thank you. We smile because we've heard your stories of teaching Connie Douglas's class and yes. how great you looked in your sneakers and leg warmers. I did. I did. Yeah. Thank you so much. Who does? Lisa has a question. Oh, sorry, Lisa. 
So I appreciate your um, concern and sharing our concern as the parents about the athletics at Hadley. We know that there was an issue in the soccer season. There's an apparent big issue now, and that's why so many parents showed up with such great concern. And I appreciate Superintendent McKenzie's time spent on talking to so many of us about it and, and really taking a lot of time and concern and writing down all of the issues about this particular issue and others. And I'm just wondering, you know, it just seems that it's unfortunate that Coach Branson is sort of the, um, you know, the guy who's getting left hung out to dry because we don't have these good policies in place yet. And yet we're getting rid of a really good coach who's done really well, who's made the town of Hadley proud, who's been a seven-year employee of the district, and through all the research and all the conversation, I haven't found a good reason for why he's not being rehired. So just throwing it out there, if there's anything we can do to keep him on our side until we can resolve this issue, that would be appreciated. And I think I echo the sentiments of a lot of the people here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just surely have uh, two more things on here. Tomorrow we will be hosting a team of teachers from Munson. Uh, these are folks, we've been doing this cross-district conversation about the educator evaluation system. They'll be talking with a few of our new teachers, a few veteran teachers, and our administrators about what's working and what isn't working in terms of educator evaluation, and our goal is to learn from one another. And also, I provided you with information about the Five College Partnership Dialogue. It will be on March 5th. It's a conversation that we started putting together, the five colleges, and I was working with the executive director there on equity. This conversation started last summer. This event will be March 5th at the UMass Springfield Center. And I look forward, I've been asked to help facilitate, and I look forward to sharing with the school committee. I imagine some of our administrators um, may attend as well, and we look forward to telling you what we learn there. The personnel report is brief. Uh, just two employees identified only by numbers to keep the information uh, private regarding their continued leave of absence. And that is it for the report. Uh, what I did not say, I'm sorry, important things to say about the students. Please, please, please come to opening night of 12 Angry Jurors, February 27th at 7.30. This is going to be a phenomenal performance, I assure you. So please come and support our students. Friday, this Friday, the 27th at 7.30, Saturday at 7.30, Sunday at 2 p.m. I find that if I go to all three performances, I enjoy plays much more. So please <laughs> come, please. I also have found that over here. I do. These are a great group of young people, and let's demonstrate that all types of extracurricular activities are important in Hadley. Um, good news for Hopkins girls varsity basketball and Hopkins boys varsity basketball. The Hopson girls will have their first tournament home game against Pioneer Christian on Tuesday, February 24th, and the boys will have their first tournament game at home against the winner of Hamden Charter and Franklin Tech on Thursday, the 26th. Both games are at 7 o'clock. And I think that really does it. That's us.